The wind is an entity without enemy. Push water and freeze it. Bring temperatures down to chill both bones and the earth, and burn skin. Wind is a presence which lofts balloons and airplanes into the heavens and cuts down mountains into sand. It lives out in the open, free of lies. A pressure sent against the walls of ramshackle houses cast out to the edges of rough-shaven fields. Ross's ghost town was barren, with iron relics left in bare lots. On the other side of the interstate, the wind lived as wild animals, as ravens, swirling high in branches, a horror to doves languishing in the high rafters of old barns, seeking haven from the bluster. Wind was a pest to old dogs lurching in the shadows, their cold hides pricked at where they hid from the draft under barbed wire fences and low branches. On the outskirts, bedroom hounds and chained lapdogs chased the odor of cats and raccoons carried on a whimsy breath of atmosphere from the bottom of trash cans or from under the back doors of homes. On the south end of town, barking dogs echoed against the south walls of north side houses. On the west side of town, the howl of stray cats fought against the eastern draft. Even God was servile to the wind. Those in the community who saw the crime as more than accident, a debt to be paid, or divine providence, prayed in silence. A deity's hand lays forth celestial law to bring order to the orderless scatter of petty lives. Before the primordial probate of post-primates, fresh from the cave and lane in state, a sacrifice was demanded, an innocent beast acted upon by a beastly act, a bloodstain on a cold patch of earth. Pain was love, reborn and modern. A man faced the chill of loss in this way to save his sanity, projecting violence purified by faith, but at the cost of his soul, a third-person honesty to first-person agony. Look up in the sky, dare to see his eye, looking upon you as you try your retribution. Ross drove to the town park, a lumpy patch of snow-painted grass. There were four slouching trees at one corner and a swing set in the center. The tin slide had a streak down the middle from children sliding down and running up the curved surface. Acting crazy as kittens playing in dangerous and daring ways, the tykes had worn the galvanizing off the handrails as well, and where they gripped the chains of the swings. The once polished surfaces now had the texture of sandpaper, from neglect and weather. The chains on the swings waved slowly in the wind, each link like hard round knuckles, segments of fingers in what could pinch fingers. The swings themselves sagged, connected to the earth by peaks of drifting snow, the end of the slide landed against a hard ridge of snow. The trees and swing set looked like cave growths, Sands Cave. Even in the best weather, children no longer played in this park. Two bicycles rested under the largest tree. One was bright red, the other green. Up on the branches were little boards nailed into the bark, a ladder leading from the bikes to the ruins of an old tree fort, daring against gravity. The wood was split where the nails pierced through, and decayed. The fort had the characteristics of barns lost in the boonies, exposed rafters and gutted walls, spider webs like thin beard growth, bird scat scaled on the boards as some deviant agent against the health of the wood, leprosy flakes, black moss and bacteria, a spectacle akin to a giant's ribcage caught in the branches. Neither bicycle had a lock. Artificial flowers and vines wound around the frames and handlebars, tires rotten, Bike chains rusted. No one touched them. The sandbox was where Regan and Raleigh played. Local kids still found toys the two buried. In spite of these trespasses on a memorial, Jeremy, Todd, Tom, Little Joe, and Big Joe brought the toys they found to the plot in the cemetery. It was an honor to the endless treasure hunting Regan and Raleigh played at. Even if the toy wasn't anything Regan or Raleigh would have wanted, there was always something left on their headstone for remembrance. The sandbox was lost under a thin snow, but for a faint outline. Ross walked across from the street and stood at the edge of the box. The bitter pre-morning wind lashed at his coat, his apron flapping out like a flag of surrender. The trees were elderly veins, cut and splayed, 
stiff from rigor after being pulled from the skin of snow. The sky overhead was thick as foam where the thin city lights reflected back. The weight of atmospheric compression over the earth brought the breath of freezing wind to the earth. Ross held fast to that spot. Mark watched through the window. Danny watched Mark. Jimmy watched from behind the steering wheel, his round face glowing in the cold dashed light. He sweated heavily, the beads of salted moisture chilling the man each time the winter air touched his face from the cracked window. Ross took something out of his coat pocket and laid it in the snow. The park didn't live in the moment as child's play, but in the past, frozen in time. <laughs>